we are beginning a new series called Love, Give, Grow. And for those of you who remember, this was the title of our generosity series of last year. But we thought this was such a good overarching series, we're using it again to help us focus on how the Christian life is about a giving life. In fact, our theme throughout the next four weeks is to help us to focus in on this love, give, grow, which we have this sort of key phrase for the next four weekends that we really want you to get into your mind and into your heart. And it's simply this. You cannot love without giving, and without giving, you cannot grow. Now, now, now listen very carefully to that statement. You cannot love without giving. And without giving, you cannot grow. Now, I'm a participatory pastor. I like people to participate. So I want you to say that with me. So I'm going to say, let's say it once or slowly. And then we're going to say it once enthusiastically. So here we go. You cannot love without giving. And without giving, you cannot grow. Let's say it one more time. You cannot love without giving. And without giving, you cannot grow. I mean, that is such a fundamental statement of what the gospel is all about, what the Bible is all about, how God helps us understand what it means to be a Christian. But it has so many implications in our life. And so we want to unpack that generosity uh, DNA that if you become a follower of Jesus, that needs to start to work itself out in your life, that you and I need to become more and more that way in our lives. So let's begin. Um, in John 16, 1, uh, we read this verse. It says, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. Jesus said that. Now, I was thinking about this verse of Jesus, and I, I think about this whole idea of when a woman is in labor, she has pain. According to the famous comedian Carol Burnett, in describing what labor pains feels like, she has said, take your bottom lip and pull it over your head. Now, on this Mother's Day weekend, <laughs> I feel that speaking anything more about that wondrous experience is stepping beyond appropriate boundaries. But when it comes to childbirth, fathers are the spectators and the mothers are the players. And we just, again, want to recognize that. But if you do want to watch something funny, you can go onto our YouVersion app and uh, we have a clip of Bill Cosby in which he talks about how he and his wife tried to experiment with natural childbirth and how um, they were delivering their first child and they went to the hospital. And, this, and the legendary comedian Cosby shares what his wife, when his wife started to give birth to their first child and the first wave of labor pain hit her, she apparently stood up in the stirrups, grabbed his bottom lip and said, I want morphine. So um, you got you to watch the clip. It's, it's a hoot. Now... Besides all the humor that, that we have heard often about that event, um, Jesus is using that experience in that illustration here in John 16, 1, to show that actually he's talking to his followers earlier in the chapter saying, if you're going to follow me, the world's not going to like you. In fact, they're going to hate you. You're going to be rejected. You're going to face persecution. You're going to be cast out of synagogues. You know, you're going to be beaten. And, you know, you, when you read early church history, you know that this was th the case. Christians ex endured tremendous persecution. And, in fact, around the world today, there are countries, if you are a Christian, you will be persecuted severely. And so he's warning them. And yet he's making this connection. He says, despite all that pain that you're going to experience, you also need to know that that's just for a season and there's going to be this wonderful joy of the promises that I'm giving you of abundant and eternal life. So you just got to see that the, it isn't just about pain, that you're going to move through the pain to the joy. Through the pain to the joy. Now, as you stop and think about this, that that illustration of Jesus, the pain, then the joy, really connects to so many parts of our life. It sounds, it rings true, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. If you're a student, you've got to go through the pain of study in order to have the joy of learning and all the new opportunities that come with that. So you high school students, as you face your exams, just remember the pain, but remember the joy that's coming afterwards. Well, it's also true to um, uh, those who know the pain of saving money. 
The pain of saving money brings the joy of financial freedom and the ability to um, manage your life better. Or there's the pain of physical training. You go through the pain of physical training so you can know the joy of better health, strength, and wellness. I, I mean, there's even the pain of working through broken relationships where there's misunderstanding, there's hurt, there's anger, there's accusations, and bitterness and resentfulness. But if you can work through that pain, you can have the joy of a restored relationship. You know, there's even the, the pain of, of failure. But with the pain of failure comes the joy of learning from our mistakes. You know, you may be thinking, well, Dave, you're really showing us something really deep today. Gosh, I'm so glad I showed up here. You're just really giving us one of those basic axioms to life, which is no pain, no gain. Well, that's true, I guess, to a certain extent. But I want to dive just a little bit deeper into this illustration of Jesus that he's given here in John 16, 21. Because this illustration of pain then joy, remember, occurs because the mother has to give of herself to the childbirth experience. And so we have this connection between giving of yourself with the pain than the joy. You know, stop for a moment and consider how mothers really demonstrate giving all through their lives, where there's pain and joy in all those giving moments. It isn't just a childbirth. There's the pain and the joy of those early years of those sleepless nights and the midnight feedings and the, and the whooping cough and the whatever's going on and, you know, whatever. Um, there's, um, then the child starts going through these changes and stages of growth. Their mood swings, their immaturities, their temper tantrums in the store, everything. And they go through the pain and the joy of that. And then, they, and then they are constantly having to manage their household in the midst of all this change in their child's lives. And then they give of themselves again when the child continues to grow and often has no clue on how much they demand. You know, in that motherly giving, most women know there's often pain before the joy comes. And many mothers, I would suggest, know this following truth better than anyone else when it comes to giving. And this is our big idea that we want to share today in this Love, Give, Grow series. Generous loving hurts, but leads to joy. If you're going to love generously, it will hurt. I'm absolutely convinced that if it doesn't hurt, you're not really being generous. But generous love hurts, but it leads to joy. In fact, that's the big idea I want to share with you today. And in fact, I just want to take a couple minutes here and just say to you, first of all, we got to first of all ask ourselves two questions around the statement of generous love hurts but leads to joy. In fact, that's such an important statement next to the one I had you say at the beginning. Let's say this one together again. Let's do it. Generous love hurts but leads to joy. Let's say it one more time. Generous love hurts but leads to joy. So the first question I want to ask you is this. How does it hurt? How does generous love hurt? You know, if we're going to be generous with others, it means that we have to be willing to set aside our self-focus. It means we have to be willing to say no to self before we say yes to others. It means we have to be willing to make adjustments in our life that initially will feel like an inconvenience, a bother, and indeed a pain to my agenda and to my needs. Put simply, generosity will hurt. It will hurt my pride, it will hurt my ego, it will hurt my schedule, it will hurt my wants, it will hurt my, my, in my conveniences. Now in this generosity series, we are talking about giving our money, giving our resources, giving our time, giving our lives. And we do know often that it's around giving our money is one of those key places where we're going to initially feel some hurt in order to be generous. You know, if we decide to love generously with our money, we will have to make adjustments. It's, it's as simple as that, isn't it? You know, I can't spend as much as I want on Starbucks or on movies or on clothes. I may need to wait and be wiser in stretching my groceries because I'm practicing generous love. Someone else will show off the latest gadget that they got from Future Shop. And I'm sort of thinking, I'm never going to be able to brag like that because I've been practicing generous love. I've been giving my money. You know, 
I think of C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity where he talks about the hurt of generosity in this way. I love this quote. I, I always, you know, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors, but, but listen to how he says this. He writes, I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, they are indeed too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures excludes them. Does your giving pinch and hamper you at all? Then your charities are too small. Often I find we get surprised by the pain that comes with sacrifice. There's always a degree of suffering when we seek to show generous love. The path of generous love will take us through the valleys of testing and trials. It all goes together. Remember, generous love hurts but it leads to joy. You know, I think of the gospel itself, the story of what we celebrate as we come together in community and what we need to live under every day of our lives. We need to be gospel-oriented people. And when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus to make us right with him. And think of, now remember, I've been talking about this whole pain and joy thing, right? Listen to it. We hear it in the very gospel story of Jesus in Hebrews 12 too. Listen to this verse. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And because of the joy awaiting him, there's the joy, he endured the cross, there's the pain, disregarding the chain. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. You know, Jesus is not only our savior, he is our example about what it means to show generous love. Christ, in order to show his generous love, kept his eyes on the joy set before him. He was accomplishing the Father's will. What joy? He was setting us free from our sins. Joy. He was providing us salvation. There's the joy. He was redeeming the world. He was defeating Satan, sin, and death. There's the joy. But this path of generous love also meant enduring the shame of the cross. It meant enduring the hurt of bearing the sin of the world. It meant knowing that his father turned his face away from the son. Generous love, I'm absolutely convinced, people, I don't care what age you are, if you want to be generous in showing your love, you want to be generous in your giving, if it doesn't hurt, it's not really generous love. You know, but but here's the thing. You're going, oh, I know what you're saying. You got to give till it hurts. But wait now, I see on the title of this message, it says, give till you're happy. Well, we're going to get to that in just a second. But you see, here's the problem. We can't stop here at the hurt. We can't get stuck here in the hurt. You know, the phrase give till it hurts is really only part of the story. Because if giving only means pain and hurt, you know what? Our culture, guess what? Our culture has told us, be happy, be comfortable. Have the nicest bed. Have the coolest car. Don't have any pain at all in your life. Avoid pain at all costs. Heaven forbid that you have any pain at all in your life. Oh my goodness. You know, stop the train. So a lot of us go, give, generous love hurts. Well, then I'm not going to show any generous love. Thank you very much. Thanks for the warning, Pastor Dave. Thank you. I will live my self-centered life. But here's the thing. If we don't go through the hurt we will miss out on the joy. And this leads us to our second question. So where's the joy? I mean, we are saying here, generous love, what is it? Generous love hurts, but leads to joy. Thank you. Okay, you're with me. So where's the joy? Well, remember the illustration of childbirth is that the pain is just really part of the path that takes us to a place of joy. I mean, joy is the destination. Joy for that mother is holding that new bundle of life with all the possibilities and all the promises. Joy is seeing that life grow and change. Joy is getting to express love to this person for the next decades to come. I mean, there's the joy. Joy is the destination. And all this joy is possible because a mother is willing to give of herself. If she's not willing to give of herself... She'll never know this statement, generous love hurts, but leads to joy. Now, let's put this in context of our giving as we are in this Love, Give, Grow giving series. I mean, 
if, if we think about giving money and our resources, I come to this verse in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, where Paul's talking about generosity. And, and listen to what he says. He talks, he's talking about joy here. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Now, next week, we'll show you what the Bible says, how you decide how much to give. But today, I want you to look at this next part. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. But notice this, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. In fact, the, the, the Greek word there is actually the root word for our English word, hilarious. For God loves a hilarious giver. Can you imagine, you imagine if we handed around the offering plate or had an offering one day, or everybody just came up just laughing as they just, you know, threw money into the offering. You know, Woo! Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? But this is what it says. God loves a, a cheerful giver. Now, now, giving in the spirit of Jesus will take me to a place of joy. When Christ gave himself... That took him to a place of joy. You see, he was pleasing the Father. He was rescuing sinners. He was in a place of love and grace. So let me ask you, where is the joy for us when we give? Well, let me begin with this. When I move into the zone of generosity with my giving and my resources, I'm now where God is. That's where Jesus is. If you are not generous, you're not, in the, you're not where God is. You're not where Jesus is. You know, the joy also comes because I start to understand the gospel better every time I give. I want my giving to reflect the loving, generous God who gave his son, Jesus Christ, unconditionally and full of grace. That's what I want my giving to, to show. Furthermore, the joy comes because God created us to be givers. In a paper published in the journal Science, researchers ran ex an experiment they, that they called the effects of pro-social spending or charitable giving. They found that giving money away, believe it or not, here's a shock of shocks, people giving money away makes them happy. In one experiment, the researchers gave people $5 bills all the way up to $20 bills and assigned them with this one project. Get rid of it by 5 p.m. And you can either spend it on yourself or, or give it away to someone else. And regardless of the amount of money they received, according to this project, those who gave the money away reported a significant uptick in their happiness compared to when their day started. And those who spent money only on themselves did not have that same uptick in happiness. You see, the findings of this study flip conventional wisdom upside down. All the advertisements that we get bombarded in this consumeristic culture of ours of North America, all the way right down here in the Moncton, where every time we walk through the mall and everything else, all of it tells us that if you spend money on yourself, you'll be happy. And that's what many people do. But self-centered people tend to be unhappy people in the long run. Here's a quote if you want to tweet this. Takers eat well. Givers sleep well. Takers eat well, but givers sleep well. You know, giving establishes what sociologists would call social bonds. And when we have strong social bonds, we feel better because now we feel connected to one another. Well, let me put this in a preacher's way. We are called to love one another. And when we love, wait now, you, when you cannot love without giving... And without giving, you cannot grow. If we are called to love, love means you give. It's rooted right into the very heart of God. And let me say, finally, about where does all the joy come from? Well, it comes from knowing that when we practice generous love, we get to see the joy of lives changed. Let me connect just a couple quick dots for you. A couple weeks ago, we saw five more people get baptized here at the Journey Church. And in this past ministry year, we've seen t over 20 people express their faith publicly in believer's baptism. They were born again. They were babes in Christ. Bible tells us when one sinner repents, all the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Now, 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 now here's, here, here we go. Let's connect the dots. How did those new lives come about? Well, let's connect it to generous love. You see, over this past year, people have been giving consistently and proportionally to the ministries of this church. And because of that money, we can afford buildings for ministry. The, the Allison Campus building, the, the Brentwood Campus building, in which there are three congregational services that happen week in, week out, 52 times a year. That's 156 services a year. We can also afford paid leadership who teaches and leads others to take that step of faith. Jen Rousel, who's over at the other campus today, our next-gen pastor has been doing a lot of dunking this year. That's 
for believer's baptism because children and youth are taking those steps of faith. And because of people gay, giving, there have been other pastoral leadership and staff who help equip others and manage others so that ministries occur week in and week out, which provides a consistent presence and witness in people's lives. And in fact, for that matter, because of people's giving, we've been able to afford to put water in the baptismal tank and also pay for the electricity so the water's warm so I don't get cold when I get in it. <laughs> now, now, now listen, when I see new spiritual life being birthed, I wonder, what if it occurred if people had not shown generous love with their giving, their money, their time, their talents, and their abilities within the Journey Church? You know, I think of so many lives that have been changed because of generous love, because people give. People who were lost in sin are now saved. Those struggling with grief and discouragement are now refreshed. Those tempted are now victorious. Those selfish are now serving. Those fearful are now bold. People who are in this community are now becoming more like Jesus because they're starting to understand you cannot love without giving and without giving you cannot grow. And they're starting to understand that generous love may hurt, but it leads to joy. But none of this would happen without that generous giving. You know, every once in a while, I wonder, you know what I wonder? I'm just, here's the human side of Pastor Dave, a little reveal. I wonder if over the last 27 years that I've been pastor here, if we just decided not to give or give very inconsistently or just give a little bit out of our pocket every week. I just wonder what, what that would have impacted my life. Well, to be honest with you, I, I would have paid off my house sooner. I'm still paying off my house. I would have had more renovations in my home. I would have taken more trips. I would have had nicer clothes, although I got pretty nice clothes on right now. I just bought these at Tip Top. <laughs> but I, I think to myself, gosh, what if, what if I had just kept and, and didn't practice generous love the way the Bible teaches in my giving? Now listen, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not here to brag. I'm not here to ask for your pity or go, oh, Dave, yeah, you give so much. Oh, Dave, good for you, Dave. No, no. See, because when I think of the ministry and the witness and the love and the learning, how we are learning how to become like Jesus and helping other people move from sin and darkness to light and life and eternal, eternal promise of God. When I think all about that, Guess what? What little bit of pain I've seen in my, that I've had to adjust in my life, some of the little things I've had to give up temporarily, I want to tell you, I see joy. I see a difference. And it's worth it. You know, at the end of this series, on the first weekend of June, I'm going to give you a heads up. We're going to have what's called a joyful weekend. It's a hilarious weekend. We're going to have a tithing challenge. You know, the Bible does teach us that, that we, are, we should tithe or give 10%. Uh, and, and the challenge is going to be this. Whether you're a student working at a summer job, I'm going to challenge you. You should, be, you should be, no one is too poor to give. You should be practicing tithing. And we're going to challenge everyone in our church family. We're going to say, God, will they step up and take the tithing challenge if they haven't moved there yet? Now, I'm very real something. That in Canada, 3% of all families that go to church is tithe. Realize that? You know what that means? I don't get discouraged with that. I think, wow, what opportunity here. Wow, we've, we've got all growth steps to take. What step will you take to that tithing challenge? Now, I know what you're thinking. Dave, tithe. Dave, that's going to hurt. And I'm going to remind you, generous love hurts, but it leads to joy. Well, I want to end with uh, an example of someone who's been very generous in their life and service to God. We have with us Bruno Susi. Uh, he's um, from Rwanda. He's, we, well, I mean, he's from Rwanda, but he's going to tell you he flew in from Ontario. And uh, he's here today to share with us his work and what God's doing in his life. Please warmly welcome Bruno Susi. Thanks, Dave. And it's, uh, it's great to be with you guys. You know, people say, are you home? And, and, and I guess... Journey Church family is as much home as, as we think of because typically Kathleen and I usually say where we live is home. But if, if we're going to have another home, this, this is it. Um, 
So um, we've had a few, a few events happen and I just try to give you a bit of an update and, and where we've been and where we're going. Um, Kathleen's really a bit out of sorts that she's not with me today. Um, she had uh, hip replacement about f almost four weeks ago and she's doing great. She's walking sometimes without the cane and just, uh, just not ready to fly. But she, did, uh, she has the opportunity to be with two of our three kids and uh, two of our four grandchildren today celebrating Mother's Day in Kingston. So our kids are doing great. Uh, Carolyn and her family are now in uh, El Paso, Texas, and uh, Laura and her family are in Kingston. And Ben has been at school in Kingston. He did really well, has, uh, finished his first year of college there, and he's in Ottawa for the summer. So we're, we're happy with that because we actually are living in the same house for, for a few weeks anyway to, so we can be together. Um, for Rwanda, most of you know, we've been in Rwanda for seven years now. Um, we've had lots of experiences and uh, lots of joys and uh, lots of sorrows and pains. <clears throat> and, um, and so I'm just going to give you a little bit of that. We, we do, um, we've been serious about this because it's been seven years. There's many people that, that have done quasi short-term projects that come in for six months or a year or two years even. And um, so we really have been committed to that work for some, some time. We've seen um, this team grow. Um, some of you recognize some of the guys here, uh, Pastor Gatto and Pastor Siwamana and uh, Esperance, and Sam and Isaiah. And, and the most recent is Ernestine. Some of you might remember working with her at the last team. She's, uh, I say she's the She's the smartest of the bunch, and I say I found her. <laughs> and so it's been a real joy to, to bring her in on the team. And it's been also a teaching opportunity because um, in the, I call her a young woman. In the Rwandan context, she is a girl. And until you have children, you don't have much to say. And so it's been a real teaching opportunity for us to, to say in our context, in our Christian work, there's neither Greek nor Jew, male or female, young or old. So it's been a real a real. Um, awesome experience to be there. And that's what we leave. Because when we think about, um, <clears throat> we've, we've seen some, some very incredible um, impact from the work that we've done. But when we're not there, these guys will still be here. And that's, that's, what, uh, that's one of the things that we, we get to leave. We have seen some 1,500 kids, orphans, who are now mostly educated, self-reliant, providing income for their siblings, looking after their households. Um, the Journey Church played a significant role in, in kickstarting our women's literacy program um, with your Christmas offering several years ago. It's now a core program that, that we, we are working with in, in Rwanda this year. There's 11 communities, over 1,000 women who will learn to read. And uh, if you, you see a 60-year-old woman reading her Bible for the first time, if that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, you're not paying attention. It's really, it's really been awesome to see that. Um, after a lot of grief, we have uh, our food security programming has been renewed for another another three years, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and that's that's a continuation of a program that's just finished, where we saw almost a thousand households who now feed their families every day, who send their kids to school, and and who who are full participants in their communities because they're not just in survival mode; they're thinking thinking for the future, and they have hope. Um, there's a lot of other examples, and I, sometimes I talk about the little people as opposed to the big people. The big people are not worried about where their next meal is coming from, and the, the little people, not in the pejorative sense, but it, those who have not a lot of, of status and a lot of, uh, of power, that's the guys that we work with. Our rural pastors, which is the majority of the people in our church, earn somewhere around 10 bucks a month, um, a lot of them have trouble sending their own kids to school. And so it's been a, a real joy to see change affected in those, those communities. Um, <clears throat> we talk about um, the joys. There's also been some sorrows. Um, the, the, the church partner we work with has uh, some of the leaders, I would say, uh, um, misunderstood when we talked about servant leadership. They saw, we said, serve me leadership. And uh, so it's been a real a real um, sorrow, in a sense, to, to see uh, injustice and uh, untruth and, and a lack of serving of the community. Uh, Pastor Andre, who was a legal rep, just resigned a couple weeks ago, so there'll be an election in mid-May, 
and I'm really hoping and praying that the leader that comes forth from that is, is a servant and wants to see the church move ahead into the, the 21st century. Uh, CBM is looking for staff to replace us. We believe strongly in accompaniment. The whole thing that happens with presence cannot be replaced no matter how many phone calls and emails you give. So that accompaniment is just such an important part of how we do things. I'm not hopeful that that will happen before uh, Kathleen and I, and I leave in October. We're going back 15th of July, so we'll be there for three months to see things wound up and to, to the extent we can uh, have that transition go. And, and the folks you see on the screen, um, they, they will miss us, and they will miss us because they loved us, but they won't miss us because now nothing works. And so that's, that's a, real, a real joy for us. Um, the transition is towards Latin America. And it's interesting that uh, on, on my journey, um, because this, this Latin America was on my heart when I was working for a billionaire that all you folks know. And I had in my heart that I was supposed to be working for the poor. And, uh, and so exploring what's that look like and how's that going to happen. And Kathleen actually encouraged me to, to go off to do a Habitat for Humanity build in Argentina and visit in Chile. We went as a family to Honduras. And our last trip together as a family was to El Salvador in 2005. And that, for me, that was the, the tipping point where it was obvious to me this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so then from there, we, we ended up not in Latin America, but in, uh, in Rwanda. And uh, so now the, the, the road continues, and it looks like we are now um, seven years down the road in Latin America. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's exciting. In a sense, it's not as, uh, um, as real for me because there's so many things that we're trying to finish well in, in Rwanda. Um, my, my role will be as the Latin America team leader, and Latin America means um, Bolivia and Brazil and El Salvador and Haiti and Cuba and a few other places. Cuba is a really uh, developing area for, for uh, our, our efforts, <clears throat> and really excited because the Cuban church, you, you might think in a, in a communist kind of system, um, would have been repressed, and in fact, it's very dynamic, <clears throat> it's very bold, and it's very poor. And there's lots of opportunities, I think, for us to have impact and to help them grow, especially as that country opens up a little bit towards uh, the rest of the world. <clears throat> Kathleen will be in a role of, of uh, combining short-term missions and the church engagement piece, and so developing opportunities for Canadian churches to develop their understanding of mission. And I think as you understand mission, you also understand how you can engage your community. So mission is, is here as well as, as far away. And so that'll be her role, trying to be uh, intentional about provoking change in the way people see, see that and, and, and participate and, and uh, just affect your community wherever you are, whether it's, it's local or, or global. So Kathleen and I are really grateful to you folks. Um, your participation in the work that we've been involved with, um, we don't take it for granted. We know many of our colleagues, they're, they're, I don't think there are very many that have the kind of relationship to their ascending church the way Kathleen and I do. And uh, so we're grateful for the support, the participation, the financing, all the, that, that stuff that really allows us to, to focus on our work as opposed to be worried about um, what's going to happen next week. So it's been just a a, a great freedom that we've had from that. And, and as Kathleen and I reflect on the past uh, several years, those, those joys and sorrows or pains, um, we feel hugely privileged to be doing the work we're doing. So yeah, some of that stuff has been a little hard, but overall, this is awesome work. And we, we every day, we think we are so privileged to be doing the work we're doing, to be in the place where we are, to be working with the people that we are working with, and to see the changes in the villages and, and the churches and the, the, the little people that, that we have been able to, to participate with to, to see those, those changes happen. So we, we really feel that we're, we're centered on where God wishes us to be, and, and that's just, uh, that overcomes any kind of, of pain, and frankly, it's, it's not pain, it's, it's a joy. So thanks so much for for having me and uh, for your, your continued 
participation in our life and work. Um, I, I want to pray for Bruno in just a minute here, and we're going to be taking up our offering and our final song. And so if the worship team wants to come up and get themselves ready, that'd be great. Um, I just want to say that we will be receiving our global mission offering, which um, will be starting this weekend. Uh, you'll be receiving, if you're part of our church family, you'll be re receiving something in the mail. Um, and it's about our support for the Susies. For the last seven years, we've been supporting the Susies with our, our May offering uh, focus. And uh, right now, our target is somewhere between four to 5,000. That would really help us to hit our, our target of support uh, for the Susies. And so please read that uh, mail out. Or if you're prepared to give today uh, in that designated way, uh, please uh, may you give generously. Um, now, let, let's, um, let's just stand um, and let's, let's pray for Bruno and Kathleen. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your generous love to us. And Lord, how when we get confronted with the very love of Christ, how it then pulls us out beyond ourselves and into this world of need. And Lord, we thank you for the, the heart for the poor that you have laid on Bruno's heart and Kathleen's heart. And Lord, we just ask that now as they have a, a, a chapter come to a close in Rwanda and now as they move to Latin America to give oversight to uh, the work that will go on in all those countries from Bolivia to El Salvador to Haiti and Cuba and other ones as well. Lord, we pray that as Bruno and Kathleen work with the church to show the love of Jesus through word and deed and to help those in deep need and deep poverty Lord, may we back here hold the ropes for them and support them well, both through prayer and through our giving, and the Lord, through our friendship with them. And we ask all this in Jesus' strong name. Amen.